Looks like it's time to start. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Having a good time. So my name is Nate Shuda. I am based out of Minneapolis, as I mentioned earlier. I, I wrote this little ebook last year. My, my wife refers to it as a pamphlet. I think she means that lovingly. I'm not 100% sure. If you're interested in these kind of topics, it's probably worth you know, the hour-ish of your time it takes to crank through that. You can get that from us for free, no problem. I, the best way to describe me, actually, these days is architect as a service. Someone called me that last year. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I kind of dig that, except I did sound the acronym out in my head. And I realized that it may not actually have been meant as a compliment. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take it in the most positive sense of the word. We shall see. Now, I've spent a lot of the last, actually, several years now talking about this thing we call the cloud. And I've had to dispel a number of myths, especially when my previous job, I had an enterprise job where we were trying to move to the cloud. And so an awful lot of that was me explaining to people what it meant to be in the cloud. I, I'm still amazed how many folks I've run into are like, well, you know, we can't possibly put our data on Google. I'm like, why, what, what's, what's wrong with, with Google's cloud product? And they say, well, because then our data would be available on google.com. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's not how public clouds work, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get through that, I hope. But there's a lot of options here. You know, I run into a lot of developers, and when we say cloud, they immediately think, ah, microservices. And I've got others that say, no, no, it's modular monoliths. And nowadays, it's very, very comforting to say, let's throw everything into a container. And you know, there's a decent chance someone in your organization has found out about this thing called serverless. Turns out there's actually still servers there, so maybe not the best name we've ever come up with. And so lots of people are writing these functions. And, and we're starting to embrace polycloud too, which I actually think is a pretty good idea. You know, I put on sort of my strategic hat and I think about what are the implications for being all in on one provider. That may not be the best place for us to be from a, a tactical or strategic standpoint. But it puts us in this situation where it's like, there's a lot of stuff we got to get our heads wrapped around. And we still need to deal with all the engineering issues that are part of this. And I know a lot of people think, oh, don't worry, there's a magic sparkle pony that makes these problems go away. There actually are unicorns. That's actually what serverless is, by the way. It all runs on unicorns. How do we avoid the pitfalls? And one of the most, I guess, tragic things that I've seen throughout my career is resume-driven design. There's a lot of times where we choose a technology not because it's the right choice to solve the problem in front of us, but because someone wants to put it on their resume. So be very, very cautious with that. So let's level set a little bit and say, you know, what do we even mean by cloud native? And of course, you should always start by asking your doctor if cloud native is right for you. This is one of my favorite tweets of this year. At the end of the day, it's fairly straightforward. These are just applications that we design that are there to take advantage of what the cloud gives us. This is fundamentally about how we create and deploy applications. And let's be honest, the cloud gives us some really interesting capabilities that we didn't have in the past. I can scale up, I can scale down. I can provision on demand instead of having to wait weeks or months to get a server put together by my infrastructure people. I technically have limitless compute, although there's a giant asterisk at the end of this. Additional fees may apply. A lot of folks are like, oh, the cloud is free or the cloud is super cheap, and it can be, absolutely. It can also be ridiculously expensive. I saw this, this thread on Twitter not too long ago. Someone said, I had a recurring 57 cent charge from Amazon and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I finally went in and dug through everything and I turned off some stuff I wasn't using and, and now I have a 23 cent recurring charge from Amazon. I don't know where that's coming from. And so it's easy for some of this stuff to get out of hand. I actually had a friend of mine was telling me they were experimenting with a function just to try it out. And so they were using this just in a lab setting and they forgot to turn it off. And at the end of the month, they got kind of a, I guess a stern phone call about the $100,000 bill they'd racked up on that one function running in a lab environment. It's not just an architectural pattern, it's this interesting combination of practices, techniques, technologies, it's agile development, it's continuous delivery, it's bringing automation into this, it's using containers, it's taking advantage of microservices, probably writing some functions. But one of the hardest parts of this is not technical, it's cultural. Culture's hard. Cultures where good ideas go to die. And we spend almost no time talking about this, unfortunately. How do we change our culture to get to this level? You know, I spent a fair amount of time in my previous job just talking to people about what's going to be different in this sort of cloud native future. You know, some of the people that push back on me would be like prod ops folks. And so one of the best ways we had to sort of get them on board was sitting down and saying, hey, what's a day in the life like for you now? And then mapping that to this is what a day is going to be like for you in the future. And just that simple exercise of listening to them 
understanding what it is they do, and then helping them see how the future is actually going to be better for you. You're going to have better tools, less toil. And they're like, oh, man, that's fantastic. And some of these folks who at, at first were our biggest, like, we hate this, ended up becoming some of our best advocates. It's definitely about DevOps. And the biggest shift I've seen probably in my career is infrastructure. I mean, think about what this used to be like. It's been this big, massive shift. When I first started in software, all of our servers were homegrown. They were bespoke, artisanal. And I tell you, I love that in my coffee. I like that in a sandwich. I'm not so sure I want that or ever wanted that in my infrastructure. It's really hard to have consistency and repeatability if it's all bespoke and artisanal. And so we would literally spend days handcrafting these things and we literally treated them like pets. We gave them pithy names. I was talking to one person, they said, oh yeah, my company, we used to name all of our servers after, after Avengers characters. You know, so there was Spider-Man and Thor and things like that. Oh, that's kind of cool. I was at one company where they were all named after Simpsons characters, which is always kind of funny. Because it's like, oh, yep, Bart went down again. Somebody has to log in and you know, turn it over. Now, I mean, we really treated them like pets. And so these are my pets. These are my cats. That's Han in the front, Chewie in the back. And I'm pretty convinced that no matter what would happen to these poor little critters, my family would entice me to spend an awful lot of money to make them happy and healthy again, because they're really kind of members of the family. You know, I, I, somebody asked me once as an icebreaker, what animal would you like to come back as if you could be any animal? And so a lot of people are like, oh, I'd be an eagle so I could fly. And oh, I'd be a lion because they're so majestic. I said, I want to be a house cat. People's first reaction was a house cat. I'm like, think about it. They sleep like 21 hours a day. They get attention when they want it. They have no predators. They have ample food supply. I mean, what's, to not, what's not to like about this gig? And so in that era of software, we would do whatever it took to keep our servers happy and healthy. We'd spend countless hours you know, patching and upgrading and trying to get them all to work. And fingers crossed, hopefully it will. And of course, these were really expensive resources. They were really heavily constrained because we were buying these proprietary things with proprietary operating systems. And so it was incumbent upon us to get our money's worth out of it. And this is why app servers became a thing. Because it was in our best interest to put as many apps as possible on one server to maximize that ROI. This makes those CFO folks happy. Of course, there's a huge unintended side effect when we now have shared resources. It sounds great in practice, Except then in reality, oh, I'm sorry, my programming bug took your application down. I came into work one random Monday morning, and it turns out one of my applications was down. I start digging into it, and I discover that, ah, over the weekend, somebody had put in a change to the MIME types on that server. Nine out of 10 applications went down. The application that needed the MIME type change was fine. Now, I don't know how this got missed in lower regions. It doesn't really matter. We were still had an outage all because, hey, look, shared resources, isn't that awesome? You've all had an experience in your career where, I'm sorry, you can't have nice things because we have this one legacy app that's not ready to take that change. So no, you can't have that feature until every single app in the company is ready to have that feature. I had a, an application I was, I was architecting and I needed or I wanted to be on our new strategic single sign-on solution. And so I did everything I could to get that lined up. And I'm like, okay, cool guys, I'm on the right servers for that. When can I have them? And the answer I got back was, oh no, I'm sorry, we're not changing the images until every single server in the company has been upgraded. So you can't be on the, single, the new strategic single sign-on solution for another year. Like, great, so I've got to be on a tactical security solution, not for the few months I had planned, but for almost a year and a half. Fantastic. If you've ever been involved with a currency project, you know why these always get short shrift. Because it's 18 months or more of freezes and testing and frustration. And this is why an awful lot of organizations said, you know what, currency's not worth it. I'm going to kick that can down the street. I'm going to make that somebody else's problem. And this is where I, I sort of conjure up that, that great Yoda quote where he says, you know, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. We didn't realize it, but we were practicing Yoda ops for quite a while in our organizations. <laughs> and if you think about what we were trying to do here, too, it was moving code from one instance of an app server to another instance of an app server. And fingers crossed, hope it's all the same. And every single one of you has had the joyful experience of, well, it worked in this region, but not in that region. And then you start pounding your head against the table and say, why? What did I do wrong? You know, what, what poor life choices led me to this, this moment in time? Because the environments are supposed to be identical. That's what my, my infrastructure people told me. They're the same. 
This happened to, to me once on a project. We worked in one region, not the other. We spent about two weeks digging into it where we discovered the only difference between those two regions was the order the patches were applied. And this is when you really start to think there's got to be a better way to make a living. You know, maybe I can still get into marketing or sales or something. There's, there's got to be another way. And of course, things started to change, though. We always evolve in this industry, and servers started to become commodities. We started to use Linux and Intel chips instead of these sort of proprietary things. And so that led to another one of my all-time favorite tweets. Dad, what are clouds made of? Linux servers, mostly. Now, that's yet another one of those differences between us and like normal people, I guess. Like We also think spring is a Java framework and not a season. You know, it comes with the territory. Now, not surprisingly, as we started moving to this more commoditized approach, prices came down. And we realized pretty quickly that servers are not the constraining factor anymore. It's us. It's the people costs. And so as things like Heroku and AWS and App Engine and Cloud Foundry and Azure started to appear, we all realized pretty quickly that, hey, shared servers are actually a liability. The reality is we need to treat these things like cows. When one gets sick, we get a new instance of cow. We don't spend lots and lots of money trying to make the cow happy. You know, if you've ever been to a large cattle operation, you realize they don't name the cows. They give them numbers. And if number 15 gets ill, that's too bad. We're going to just have to get ourselves a new instance of number 15. And that's not always how it works. I actually grew up on a hobby farm, and so we had cows as, as pets, basically. Although, in fairness, we did name some of them as a reminder of what did lay in their future. So there was like a steak, you know, and like rump roast, just, just, just for your own mental part of like, oh, don't get too attached to this one, right? We, we had one, she was basically like an 800 pound dog. I mean, she would just come up to you and you'd kind of scratch her behind the ears and she'd sort of moo at you. When she was a baby, we called her Houdini because she knew how to get in and out of the pens at will. And we never figured out how she did it. And she never went very far because, you know, she knew where mom was, she knew where food was, she wasn't stupid, but somehow she could get in and out. And, and she'd show up in the most random place. I was sitting in my living room one day and I could kind of tell there was like something behind me. And I look over my shoulder and on my back deck, here's this calf just looking at me like, can I come inside? You know, it's like, no, no, you're not housebroken. We came up with some new abstractions. We got containers, we got PaaS you know, platforms to change this sort of approach. And so now the approach says, you know, just take the app and give it everything it needs. Move that from environment to an environment. In fact, in a lot of cases, we're not moving it at all. We're just changing some routing tables. And so now if it worked in dev, I've got a pretty high confidence it can work in another region because it's the same thing. We have some consistency, this is huge. Now, because I'm no longer dealing with shared resources, if you'd like to upgrade to a new version of Java or you'd like to add this particular library, go ahead. You're not impacting anybody else. We don't have to wait for that lowest common denominator application in our portfolio anymore. It fundamentally moves the value line for us, and that's huge because it's in our best interest to always be working on high value things. We want to get out of the business of doing undifferentiated heavy lifting. You know, the way that we've been trying to get people to think about this ultimately is, Here's my code, run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. That's the ultimate goal of any of these approaches. Take my source code, run it. Thank you. And so we've started to see this big change now in how we approach development. Instead of having these quarterly releases and this very slow, methodical approach, we can finally embrace that always be changing mindset. We can experiment. We can do A-B testing. This used to be the sole purview of the big technical companies, you know, your Googles, your Amazons, your Twitters, people that could actually afford to do that. Now this is something every company can do. We can all do hypothesis-driven development, which is fantastic. I can actually be responsive to the business changes. I can start turning things around in days or weeks instead of months or years. And the reality is we have to be able to do that today. The demands on our businesses are just getting faster and faster and faster. This whole, oh, yeah, you can have in 18 months just doesn't cut it anymore. And so I was at Spring One a couple years ago, and a gentleman from Scotiabank got up and talked about how they moved from the traditional quarterly releases to doing thousands of releases a month. Now, they didn't get there overnight. That wasn't a snap your fingers, and on Tuesday we're doing it. This is a multi-month, multi-year process. What was so fascinating to me is I had a bunch of friends of mine, people I used to work with were at this conference, and I was chatting with them in the hallway one day, and they said, oh, man, that's great, but you know, Nate, we could never do that. And I said, why not? Scotiabank is a bank. There are a few industries that are as heavily releg um, regulated, there we go, that's the word, as financial services. You're in the same line of work, essentially. If they can do it, you can do it. Speed matters today. Whether we like it or not, disruption is impacting every single business. There is not an industry that's immune today. 
This became really clear when Amazon bought Whole Foods. Amazon's coming for everybody's lunch money. I've seen some insurance companies say, oh yeah, actually Google's a competitor of ours. Because what's insurance at the end of the day? It's information, it's, it's a, a risk model. They're pretty good at dealing with lots and lots of information. Now as a software engineer, it's very easy for me to say this, a lot of folks haven't quite gotten comfortable with this, but we're all technology companies today, whether we want to be or not. Now, of course, as soon as I talk about cloud native, I have to mention 12 factors, AKA the 12 factor app. This is just a set of characteristics that are shared by successful applications, at least as defined by Heroku. I will say, frankly, these are just good design approaches, regardless of your ultimate you know, living ground for these things. But one code base in version control, multiple deploys. Version control is not controversial anymore, right? We all use version control, we all use Git, or we use Git, perhaps you're using Git. I remember, th this is several years ago, I, I was helping somebody at my, my company, a friend of mine, he said, hey, you know, I've got this, this, pro, this bug I'm running into, can you look at it? I'm like, sure, send me the link to your repo. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, your subversion repo, send me the link, I'll look at your code. He's like, oh, no, no, we're, we're not in subversion. I said, oh, are, are you guys still on clear case? He said, no, no, we're not on that either. I said, well, what other version control systems do we have here? And he said, oh, I keep my code out on the LAN. And I just sort of back slowly away. Like, I can't help you, I'm sorry, you're on your own. There's nothing I can do for you. We need to explicitly define our dependencies. This one tends to be difficult, by the way. I can't rely on something being there. My configuration's got to be separated from my code base. I need to treat any backing service as an attached resource. I need to have this build, release, run life cycle. Got to be stateless, or at least if I'm going to put state, it's got to be somewhere durable. It can't be the file system. And export all services via port binding. We're going to scale horizontally, aka by process, not vertically. We're not going to make bigger hardware. I need to start up fast, shut down fast. I have violated this more times than I care to admit in my career because I built a lot of apps that on startup did what? They go out to the database and call a thousand tables and load a bunch of stuff into memory because you know we didn't know about these things called caches. I need dev prod parity. I've never worked on software and said, oh no, it's great if dev and prod are completely different. That makes my job so much easier, thank you. I got to treat logs as an event stream. This is a bit of a shift just because I can't SSH into a server and look at a log file because it's not going to be there when I come back in an hour or a day or a week. So I've got to put that somewhere more durable. And then I need to run these admin tasks as a sort of one-off process. Now, if you've got legacy apps, which I assume you do, they're going to violate some of these. There's a chance you might violate all 12, probably not. In general, the ones I see violated most often, dependencies, this one's hard. This can be a difficult one to satisfy because you sit there and you throw a bunch of stuff in your lib folder and it works and you're like, don't touch it. You know, we've all had that discussion. It works, don't touch it, it's fine. This is what NPM runs on as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm convinced that NPM is actually a distributed backup of the internet. In this room right now, we probably have a complete copy of the internet. So if it goes down, we're good. We're back up and running in an hour, hour and a half tops. We need to separate configuration from the code. I've hard-coded a credential or two in my time. I'm sure you have as well. Hard-coded a database connection. Can't do that if we're moving to the cloud. I need to be stateless. This is hard because an awful lot of applications were designed on a specific flow. Off ah, page one to page two to page three, and we leave little breadcrumbs along the way. I've certainly uttered this phrase, oh, just stash that in session. It's easier than we can just go grab it. Yeah, that doesn't work in these environments. It doesn't work as soon as we try to you know, do any kind of load balancing. Then we start running into all sorts of fun problems. Need to start up fasting to shut down easily. I've built a lot of apps that violate this one, so I, I completely understand it. The reason this is an issue is now my health checks are impacted. Because whatever you've got sitting in front starts up a new instance, says, are you healthy yet? No, you're not. Are you healthy yet? No, you're not. Oh, you must be have a problem. I'm going to spin up another instance. And it keeps doing that until you run out of compute. Dev prod parity, I need my environments to be consistent. This is not controversial in any way, shape, or form. Ultimately, I need to shorten that cycle from code to prod. We cannot utter, it worked here, but not there. A friend of mine actually made up stickers, works on my box. And if you uttered that in a meeting, he'd slap it on your laptop. It was not meant as a badge of honor. This was a shaming technique, like you're never supposed to say that. So this is something we've always wanted, whether you factor it in 12s or not, doesn't matter. Do you need to be fully 12-factor compliant to go to the cloud? Absolutely not. It's a great goal, so you know, certainly strive for that, but we have to be ruthlessly pragmatic. There's just no getting around that. You know, in a perfect world, yes, we'd completely rewrite our applications from the ground up, but we just don't have that luxury. You have to understand that certain things, if you don't fix them, you're not going to get the full advantage of the cloud. If I've got a long startup time, it's going to make it really hard to both scale elastically and heal as necessary. 
Ultimately, this is a continuum. So if we think about it as sort of like 12 factor compliance, the further down that path I get, the more benefit I'm ultimately getting. Ironically enough, people are starting to talk about 15 factors or beyond the 12 factors. I don't really think it matters too much how we think about it. The moral of the story is if you want to get everything you can out of the cloud, your application needs to be designed to take advantage of that. So yes, your legacy applications are going to fall short. That's okay. Opportunistically refactor. Be ruthlessly pragmatic. If you are building Greenfield, go cloud native from day one. Do not build legacy. Now, I can't say cloud native without saying microservices. I think it's right there in the contract. This is fundamentally a reaction to monoliths and heavyweight services combined with what the cloud gives us because monoliths aren't a lot of fun. Your developer productivity is never very high in a monolith. It's really hard to get your head wrapped around these giant code bases. It takes a long time to ramp up. I was at one company where the expectation was it would take you a full year to be productive in their code base, a year. That makes for a tough experience on both sides of the coin. You hire somebody and basically you're going to sit here for a year before we can actually you know, rely on you for stuff. One of the reasons why we always do these big quarterly releases or annual releases is because, well, if I make one change, I got to deploy the whole thing anyway. So I might as well just wait until I've got 1,500 changes. Because then if something breaks, it's really easy to know what caused the problem. Now those go hand in hand, right? Much less risky to deploy a whole bunch of changes at once and fingers crossed hope it works than just to deploy one small change. Scaling was a problem too, because I had to scale the whole thing up whether or not you know, I needed it, just this little part needs it, too bad, I got to scale up the whole thing. That's why a lot of our apps had single digit server utilization numbers, which was unfortunate. It's really difficult to evolve in these environments. There's a pretty good chance somewhere in your educational career you learned about the second law of thermodynamics. I've got a 12 year old at home, so I have now started calling this the teenager's bedroom problem. The universe wants to be disordered. And I hate to say it, our code is not immune from this. Every single one of you has started on a project, a Greenfield project, and uttered something along the lines of, this time, we're going to do it right. <laughs> the packages are going to be well layered, we're not going to cross the streams. And then like six months later, like, oh my God, what happened? Actually, you know, one of my favorite things when you're digging through code and you're looking at something and you're thinking like, well, what idiot wrote this? And then it dawns on you that it was you. And like, oh yeah, this was me from like six months ago. Drat. I guess I, I'll have only myself to blame. And of course, over time, it takes longer and longer for us to add new features, takes longer and longer to fix bugs. And so part of that is what's given birth to this quote unquote new style, AKA the microservice. Now, there is no one true de definition here. It's really in the eye of the beholder. You'll know it when you see it, which leads me to one of my favorite tweets from my boss who wants to argue about the definition of made up words with me. We spend a lot of time doing that in this industry, don't we? No, no, that word doesn't mean this, it means that. Fine. I'm partial to anything that can be rewritten in two weeks or less. Some people like to define it in terms of two pizza teams. The thing I dislike about this is there, there's a few components that are missing. Well, how big are those pizzas? Because that's basically a single serving size pizza. That's something actually my dad makes. He's got this really cool like brick oven thing he, he, he made like three or four years ago. It's fantastic. You know, my dad really got into it. He gets like this special like Italian flour that's imported. I mean, it's, it's just nuts. It's really good. How hungry are we? You know, we're sitting here, we're kind of before lunch. My guess, I throw a pizza on this table, it's going to go pretty fast. After lunch, that same pizza might sit here and get cold because, well, everybody just had lunch. But the real problem I have with the two pizza team concept is how many services can a two pizza team take on? This is a question my director came to me with as we were moving towards the cloud. He says, Nate, I, I, need to, I need advice. What am I supposed to tell teams? And I said, well, it depends. He didn't like that answer. The reality is, it does depend. How volatile are their services? If they're really volatile, they're changing all the time, a two pizza team might only be able to handle three, four, five. If they're stable and they've been around a while and they're not changing at that, that pace, that exact same team might, only, might be able to handle 20. Who knows? I think it's more important to think of this in terms of characteristics. They are a set of small, focused services that do one thing and only one thing, and they do it really, really well. This is sort of that Linux or Unix model. You pipe together simple tools to get complicated outputs. They should be independently deployable. I'm amazed how many times I talk to people and I say, what happens when you deploy this microservice? And they say, oh, these other six services get deployed too. I'm like, why? Did they change? No, but they all have to go together. I'm like, that's not really microservices maybe? They're supposed to be independently deployable. Maybe what you got there is a little, little modular monolith. They should be independently scalable. They should be able to evolve at different rates. 
They should give you the freedom to choose the right technology for the job, although this gets abused a lot. This is seen by a lot of developers. Oh good, finally I can use that language I've been trying to put on my resume. If only I could convince my manager it was the right choice. These things are built around business capabilities and fundamentally it applies this, high cohesion, low coupling. This is the zeroth law of computer science right here. If you look at the gang of four patterns and you thumb through them, you realize a shocking number of them are basically this at a different level of abstraction. So I would argue that microservices are high cohesion, low coupling applied to services. Now, at the end of the day, it's just another approach, it's a style, it's a pattern, it is not the golden hammer that will solve every problem you've ever had, I'm sorry. I know some developers think it's the answer to everything, it's just a tool. The challenge for us is picking the right tool for the job. The analogy I've been using for the last year or so is actually construction. Now, I'm a software person, I know nothing about hardware, which means I have one hammer and that's more than enough for me to screw up any project around the house. My wife and I just finished our basement, by which I mean we paid people to do the job because I actually wanted it to be finished in my lifetime and I wanted it to actually look good and be nice. And so when those folks show up, they don't just have one hammer, they have a truck full of hammers. And there's one hammer they use when they're doing the framing work and there's another hammer they use when they're putting in the trim because you don't use the same hammer for those jobs, they're different jobs. What separates me from them is they know when to use which hammer. So that's the challenge for us is use them wisely, which is part of the reason why I wrote this blog series last year on responsible microservices, aka should that be a microservice? And so many folks are just diving down that path like, yeah, microservices, like, well, hang on a sec, do you need them or not? If you need them, they're great. If you don't need them, well, it's actually quite painful and can make things much harder than they need to be. You end up paying this complexity tax and you get no benefit for it and that's no fun for any of us. Now my friend Simon's got a lot of interesting ways of thinking about this. He says, well, if you can't build a monolith, what makes you think a microservice is gonna be the answer? He likes to say, if you can't handle a big ball of mud, what makes you think a distributed big ball of mud is somehow gonna be easier? And yes, sometimes the right answer is a modular monolith. I mentioned serverless before because of course everyone's diving down that path. You know, we went from IaaS to CAS to PaaS and now everybody's very excited about serverless and trying to recreate their whole application as a function because everything is something as a service now. I actually had somebody came to me last year and said, I'm gonna rewrite my entire application as a series of functions. I thought, good luck to you. You know, there are probably a single digit number of applications in the world that actually are just a series of functions. My guess is we aren't working on those systems. I mean, it's, it's possible, but not, not likely. Are there places in the applications you have right now where a function might be a great fit? Probably, almost undoubtedly. So we have to be a little cautious about the lemming effect here, and I've seen a lot of people, oh, but I read this white paper about how such and such a company saved a bunch of money, or they did this and they did that. Do you have the same constraints? Do you have the same forces working on you? Do you have the same problems? And of course, some folks look at this and say, hang on a sec here, I just refactored to cloud native microservices, you know, I checked that box, and now you're telling me I need to go to serverless, you know, that makes me kind of grumpy. You know, maybe you might take it to the next level and start flipping tables. My wife actually saw this slide when I was working on this deck and she looked at me and she's like, what is that? I said, it's table flip. She said, what? I said, yeah, I see table up in the air, arms up in the air, table flip. She just shook her head and walked away and said, you have a weird job. So you're not wrong. So no, don't throw away that code quite yet. FAS is just a subset of serverless, so some people use those terms interchangeably. And as I mentioned before, there are still servers, sorry. We're just further abstracted away from them. It's not our job to provision and update and scale. Now, a good friend of mine, remember my team, Mr. Paul sent this out. He said, what idiot called it serverless and not DevOpsless? Honestly, I think serverless rolls off the tongue a little nicer. I think that's part of it. Although he's Australian, so anything he says sounds cool. In other words, it's someone else's problem. Now, there are a lot more moving parts now, which is why Sam sent this tweet out last year, and he said, hang on, haven't we made the problem a lot worse? I've got all these layers now that I have to worry about when it comes to patching and updates and currency and bugs and things I need to fix and be responsible for, and he's not wrong. But Josh responded back and said, that's why we have platforms. That's why we have things like Cloud Finder. That's why we have things like the public cloud providers so that you are only responsible for the code. You let somebody else handle the rest of it. I know it's very fashionable for everybody to say, oh, I'm using Kubernetes today, or I'm using Docker today, and that's cool. But hopefully you haven't built your own platform 
because most of us, that's not how we want to make our money. And do not underestimate the challenge of maintaining those environments. Very easy to get one spun up. Everybody in this room is capable of doing that. It's the, oh, hey, look, a new version came out. Can you get updated on it? How long is that going to take? Now, it's important to understand these are all just layers building on top of one another. We still have IaaS. That's still there. That's still how we provision this underlying hardware. We may not have to do it ourselves anymore. Someone else might be doing it for us. We could use containers, in which case we bring the container to the party. And that container environment is responsible for scheduling, networking, routing, logs, et cetera. I could rely on a platform, and then now that container comes along for free, so to speak. And all I have to worry about is my application code. And that platform gives me the images, networking, monitoring, metrics, maybe a marketplace, maybe some quota, some way of breaking things up. If I go to serverless, the container's supplied for me. You could argue the application, so to speak, is supplied for you, because all I have to worry about is a function, a small chunk of code, and that environment is responsible for executing it, scaling it, turning it up, turning it down, binding to that event stream, et cetera. The real difference between these typical approaches is what am I responsible for versus what comes from the platform? And more importantly, what workload fits in which bucket? Not all workloads fit in all buckets. So it's just another level of abstraction. Now, another way of thinking about this is the layer cake. Yes, there is still hardware there. This does not, in fact, run on like unicorn tiers. There is IaaS to provision that hardware. There's containers on top of that. There's platforms that we can build on top of that, and then serverless lives on top of that. The further down I go, the more flexibility I have. I can still work at the raw hardware level if I want to, but I'm responsible for everything now. I made my grad students do that this year. I said, okay, spin up an instance on any of the three providers and install Nginx. Not a, to not a terribly difficult thing to do. This is a couple hours, but the point I was trying to make to them is now you are responsible for maintaining that if this was something you were running in production. That's where the pain comes from but you can configure exactly what you want with exactly what you need, open up whatever ports you need, et cetera, et cetera. The higher up that you go, the less flexibility you have, you're constrained in these serverless environments, you do not get unlimited runtime, you do not get unlimited resources, you do not get to choose any language ever invented ever. You are constrained, but it's also more efficient for both your operational side and for your developer side, because there's less for you to worry about. It's trade-offs. You want to push as many workloads as high up the stack as possible. Now, there's a ton of options today. Lambda was what sort of kicked this off, but all the major providers have their own variant. There's a bunch of open source versions like Knative and Riff and things like that. My big problem right now with serverless is it suffers a bit from that shiny new thing curse. You know, as developers, we had, tend to be like dogs chasing squirrels, and we're just like, ooh, look, something shiny and new. And then we go chase after the next shiny and new thing, and it's just another instance of resume-driven design. So there is a little bit of that that comes along for the party. We need to watch out for the lemming effect here. It's very easy to jump off that cliff because, oh, I read a white paper about how this company was very successful with it. Great. Do you have the same problems? Do you have the same constraints? Do you have the same forces working on you or not? Now, I'm a fan of it. There's really good reasons to use it. It's more than just a new way to cloud. The efficiency gains here are fantastic. My development efficiency is great because now as a developer, all I have to worry about is this function, 5, 10, 15, 20 lines of code. I can focus on solving the business problem, not the underlying dial tone. Now there's a decent chance several of you actually do know what operating system you're running on, which is fine. Although anytime I ask this question, it's pretty easy to say something like Linux. It gets more challenging if I say, great, which distribution and which patch level are you on? That's usually where people start to stumble a little bit. The moral of the story is, is that really something you want to focus your time, effort, and energy on? Is that something your customers want you to worry about? Now, it's table stakes. It has to be done. Don't get me wrong. We have to stay current. But our customers have never baked us a proverbial cake because we upgraded servers from one version to another. Again, where's the value line? We don't want to do undifferentiated heavy lifting. So this is Andrew Clay Schaefer. This is the guy I ultimately report to. I love this slide. Good job configuring servers this year, said no CEO ever. He's absolutely right. That's not where the value line is for us. We need to focus on solving business problems, adding features, fixing bugs, not dealing with underlying plumbing issues. Now, from an operation standpoint, part of what makes functions so interesting is if they haven't been called, we can terminate the container. And when the container is terminated, you pay nothing. And so when a request comes in, we spring a new container into existence, 
and it's ready to serve traffic. Now there is a cold start penalty that we usually pay here as part of that, although there's a couple different techniques to get around it. Where people tend to get caught here is, oh look, a whole bunch of them are free. Although again, there's a big asterisk at the end of that, additional fees may apply. A lot of the, the providers, if you're doing data transfer, if you're leveraging some other service they have, you're going to pay extra for that. So no, functions are not in fact free. You are paying this weird fractional cost per request, and it is a weird fraction. On the surface, it looks like nothing because it's like less than a penny. But do you know what happens when you multiply a small number by a big number? What comes out the other end of that equation? Is it a small number? Turns out it's a pretty big number. Again, a friend of mine, her company, they spent $100,000 on a function they left running by mistake. That is shockingly easy to do. You end up getting charged based on the number of requests, how long it took to service those requests, and how many resources you needed for that particular request. It can be really, really hard to figure out how much this is gonna cost. All the providers will give you little calculators, you know, grain of salt when you use those, you may wanna run your own numbers. You probably wanna have a best case scenario, worst case scenario, super worst case scenario, just so that you're not caught off guard by how much this could cost you. But for certain, certain workloads, it's as, as cheap as it gets. From the operational side, it's fantastic. Again, my, my friend Paul likes to call this DevOpsless. You know, it is sort of serverless ops. It's a lot less for us to worry about. This is where, again, the platforms become so powerful for us. So take advantage of that where it fits. It is not, in fact, a solution for every problem you ever ran into. I, I've had a lot of people say, oh, you know, I, I can't use Java as a function because Java is slow, and so that's why we had to do this instead. As far as I'm concerned, if you chose to use serverless in a situation where latency was an issue, you made a bad architectural choice. The language underlying it is irrelevant, and Java can be ridiculously fast. If you don't believe me, go, go search for anything Dave Sire's been talking about for the last year and a half. Java is plenty fast. If your end user is going to feel the pain of a cold start, you've chosen the wrong abstraction. Please don't do that. Right, that should be obvious. If you're doing a batch run and the first one takes three seconds and all subsequent ones take 300 milliseconds, who cares? But if some poor end user is gonna be sitting there waiting because you've gotta fire up a bunch of functions, you made a bad architectural choice, it has nothing to do with the underlying language. That should be pretty obvious. Now, I, I would love to have known where this particular talk was given, but somebody suggested at a conference it's a best practice to avoid cold startup times by having a second function that constantly pings your other functions so it never terminates. I mean, seriously, that's one of those where like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, that, that should be obvious. That's not what we're going for here. Now, you have an existing environment. You have to try to get this into a cloud environment in some way, shape, or form. You better know where you are to begin with, so you need to assess your applications. Some are gonna be fantastic candidates. Others, not so much, I'm sorry. So we need to understand the applications in our world. So there's certain technical characteristics we need to know. What's the tech stack? What version of that tech stack are we on? How many users do we have? How many transactions are we getting per second? What components do we use? What third party things do we use? What's our data integration look like? How do we access our data? Do you use any internal frameworks? Guess what, the answer to this is almost always yes. I'm amazed how many times we build our own, roll our own wheels as it speaks. Do you have any batch jobs? Probably. Hopefully you have some CI, CD in place. You've got some kind of a build pipeline, I hope. Maybe you've got some test coverage. Take test coverage with a little bit of a grain of salt. A friend of mine told me this story last year. He was brought onto a project because they had a lot of regressions, and so he was there to try to help them figure out where all these regressions were coming from. And so one of the first questions he asked was, do you guys have tests? Oh yeah, we've got like 90% code coverage. Like, oh, that's great, fantastic. And you're still having lots of regressions, oh, okay. So he starts digging into the, the code and he's looking at the tests and he kind of notices a pattern, but he thinks it's isolated. And he digs a little deeper and finds out, oh, it's not isolated at all. And so he goes to the lead and he says, listen, I was looking through your code and I was looking through your tests and I couldn't help but notice none of your tests have any asserts. And the lead just looked at him and said, well, yeah, but, but we've got like 90% code coverage. Okay, I don't think those words mean what you think they mean. We need to understand how much effort is it gonna take for us to refactor. Now there are certain red flags that we need to be aware of. Do we have any vendor dependencies? Are we writing to the file system? Are we reading from the file system? How long does it take for this app to start up? How long does it take to shut it down? 
Are we using any non-HTTP protocols? Do I have any hard-coded configuration hiding in here? Do I have any shared state? Am I doing distributed transactions? These never worked well to begin with. They don't work in the cloud at all. As I start the transaction, then my container gets blown away because of something, and I come back, whoop, sorry, I'm gone. You should look at the 12 factors. How closely does this app map to the 12 factors? This is a sliding scale. You will be out of alignment to some extent. Now, I'd like to tell you, oh, sure, I can go look at your app and tell you what it is. I can't. You need subject matter experts. This does not happen in a blink of an eye. My experience takes three to four hours per app, maybe a little longer. I strongly advise that you have a little application to store all this data. Excel is not, in fact, an application platform. When I did this, my previous org, our enterprise architects handed us Excel spreadsheets to use. Being too foolish to think ahead to realize what's going to happen when I get 400 of these back, and then my director starts asking me all sorts of SQL-like questions. How many apps don't have this? How many apps have this? How many apps do this? And I'm like, I can't answer that for you because I have 400 spreadsheets. Now, luckily for me, one of my friends is like an Excel wizard, and so he took them and did some crazy macro stuff, and it all works, and I could actually answer some of those questions, but I would still be like flipping through those things now if, if he had not done that. So if you've got five applications, great, use Excel. If you've got anything more than that, please build a little application to do that for you. You're ultimately going to have some buckets here, low, medium, high, red, yellow, green, whatever makes sense. These cutoffs are going to be arbitrary. So just take a step back. Does that look about right? Ask yourself what the business value of that app is and consider the life cycle. Is it strategic? Are we going to continue to invest in it? Or is it going away in the near future? Now, retirement is not a hard no. You need to ask when it is going to be decommissioned. I was talking with one of my prod ops people about this, and he laughed and he said, oh yeah, when I started the app I first went on to, I was told it's Mark Sunset. And he said, it's still running today. I said, really, when did you start here? He said, oh, 25 years ago. I went, ah, yeah, I see how that goes. Now, if it's gonna go away in a couple months, obviously it's probably not worth your effort. If it's gonna be around for a few years, it probably is. Now you gotta do some planning. What are we trying to get to? Cloud native? We just get it running on the cloud? You're gonna to have to do some amount of refactoring. What does it take to do that? The only answer I can give you is it depends. I recommend you do a pilot. You'll get a feel for it. In my experience, it's a few weeks or so per app. There are people who have done this time and time again. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I'm a big fan of having a lab that helps people with this. And so we did at my last company, we had a lab full of, group of, of people that did this. You'd pair with the teams that were migrating. Pairing is the key word here because we need to grow these skills. Once you have that sort of figured out, you can do a rough roadmap. When can these applications move? And it does not need to be the entire application. It could be part of the application, a deployable unit, if you will. So move what you can, knowing that people will have interesting debates about what the word application means opportunistically migrate, but have at least a rough idea of when. And of course, you need to ask yourself, does this actually meet the needs of my stakeholders? And if it doesn't, how can I speed it up? I wish you luck. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I will mill about if you have questions, but I'm going to get off the stage now. Cheers.